You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on, and today's guest, we've got Michael Emmett. How are you, Michael? Nice to see you, James. I'm good, thank you. How nice are you? Nice to see you. Yeah. We've got a few connections. We certainly have. Former drug smuggler, spent over 12 years in prison. You were actually dubbed up with your father, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was with, with my father. Yeah, I was arrested with my father. All over Spain, prisons. You've lived a life, yeah. coming from addictions, drug addiction, sex addiction. Yeah. As if I'm fucking talking to myself here. <laughs> <laughs> How, How have you been? How have I been? Yeah. I've been all right. I'm okay. Just life's life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I try to, uh, each day I have to take care of myself. You know, I have to be mindful of, of who I am and what I can do and what I can't do. And I think my, my life today is about reaction. Um, I, I can so easily run with reaction with resentment, but I try to speak from my heart. So I try, my action today, I'm trying to do love and be kind. Yeah, That's what I'm trying to do. You try to get some peace in your life from yeah. trauma kind of to redemption kind of thing. Well, I, I was, you know, my trauma was at a very young age. I was sexually abused as a child. And, um, and that was one contribution, but I think where the, where my trauma lies, I'm really, I'm really into the, um, so my, I've wrote a book called Sins of Fathers. I'm not plugging it, but the reason I've put it Sins of Fathers is because the ancestral side of my life from my father's father was suicide, violence, um, sexual addiction, alcohol addiction, not drugs because they wasn't into drugs, although my father was a drug smuggler. And I think I inherited that. So that behaviour was apparent in me from a very, very early age. And I just think it, in, it increased my trauma. So I was a very traumatised kid. Yeah, I was, James, yeah. What is, where did you grow up? I was born in South, I was born South London, not far from where we are now, in a place called Stockwell, Clapham. Um, my, my father's from Battersea. Um, my mother was from some South East London, sort of the elephant, Bermondsey, around there. And I was born in Stockwell. But my father, at a very young age, when I was about seven, um... He'd been married four times, my dad, and this was his second marriage. And uh, he had three children in this marriage. And I think he wanted us to get us out of London to give us a chance to... We moved to Surrey, uh, and Surrey was Surrey. I we're talking about 50-odd years ago. So it was a culture shock to me, but I, I spent a lot of my years in Surrey. Who, what age did you get abused? Was it sex? Between five and six, and then it happened again with the same individual when I was about eight or nine. It was a babysitter. Um, so it happened three or four times, but three or four times too many, James, you know. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. Do you know, see, when you spoke about your father being a drug smuggler, this and that, do you, play, do you think karma plays a part as well? If then yeah. your kids end up becoming addicts as well? Well, I don't. I think karma does play a part. I think that there's a, we reap what we sow, James. Yeah. So I think what we do has an effect on our children's children. Uh, so I think what my dad done... Uh, the criminal element, the fraternity of people he was around. You know, it creates a character. And I do believe there's no free lunches. So, yeah, whether you want to call it karma, yeah, uh, yeah karma ain't a bad word, but I think it does create uh, a knock-on effect to, 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 to the next generations. I do that. Do you come from a big family, Michael? Yeah, well, I'm from a very huge family in on my parent, my, my mother's side, uh, my my grandmother, I think there was 11 children, and my grandfather, I think there was 14, something like that. So my grandparents were from a massive family, and so I've got lots of cousins and, and, and aunts and uncles and, and people I don't even know. But on, on, on the immediate family, my father had uh, three sisters. There was lots of children there. And my mother had five brothers and sisters, and there was lots of cousins there. And we're now, me and my sister, we have about, I've got four children, she's got five, and there's 11, uh, sorry, nine grandchildren. It's a big ass family, <laughs> mate. <laughs> it's a big ass and family. That, your dad, when did you realise your dad was active? Because he was friends with the great train robbers and stuff, huh? Very much so. I mean, all the great train robbers was his mates. Um, 
and all that old sort of fraternity in London. Back they call it old school, like the Freddie Foremans of the world. You know, he he, he knew the Cray Twins, the Richardsons, uh, Frankie Fraser. They was all his mates. And when I first really, it's funny as kids. I mean, you know, you you, you teach a kid French at five. He's fluent by seven or eight. So we have an awareness of, of what's going on. And in our subconscious mind, I could see certain things about my old man. Like he's, he was pretty violent a couple of times, not to us, but I see it happen twice in the street. And um, I was only a kid on the, on the second occasion. He had a fight with a fella and he parked me up around the corner. I wouldn't say he meant to do it. It was just, you know, it was his, it was his territory. It was his turf is what he'd done. And, um, he whacked this fella and the geezer run away. And as a fella run around the corner, sod's law, he, he fell on the car that I was sitting in. I was about eight or nine. So I see this very bloodied face against the window, frightened the life out of me. My father come around the corner, see the geezer at the car, went to hit him again. Dad, I screamed. Something like that happened. We have spoken about it. We did speak about it. And he grabbed me in his arms and he started to cry and say, son, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, yeah, I, that's when I knew. And then I see him doing some, I was about 14, I was in the garage, he was making number plates. And then I used to meet his friends and maybe see him in the newspapers. So the subconscious mind was aware. So we was living a lie, to be honest with you, because he didn't portray himself as a, as a villain where we lived in Surrey. He portrayed himself as an antique dealer. So it was always something that, you know, we had to keep our mouth shut. Yeah, it. kind of a mystery about him. So he was friends with the Richards and Zandy so he didn't stand with one firm. He was just... No. Uh, he was an Andy boy, the old man. He could have a right old fight, the old man. Um, and I think, you know, back in the day, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, he had a huge amount of respect, my father, because back in the day, if you could have a fight, you know, you, you, you was, it was like war, I think. You know, it was that the credibility, their CV. Can you have a fight? Have you robbed the bank? Can you smuggle drugs? It, it just came with the territory. So, yeah, he was Andy. I think they all respected the old man on the cobbles. Where is? Did you start getting into trouble yourself, Michael? <laughs> well, I went to a nice school. Private? No, but it was it was in Surrey and it was a good school. My children went to private schools. Not that it done them any good. <laughs> so I was, uh, yeah, I was. Um, I went to an high school. It was a rugby school. Um, it was all. It was. It was geared up for sort of A level students. But at the age of thirteen or fourteen, I excelled at sport. I liked rugby, swimming, and and, and all things like that, and athletics. But I didn't get school. Uh, my sister and my brother were extremely bright, so was my father, but I didn't get it. I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't listen, and I started to realise I was different. Dyslexic? That could have come into it, James, but it was concentration level. Do you think that was the trauma you'd went through as a kid? Maybe, James. It could have had something to do with it, or I, like, there's, there's loads of medical names for it today, but I would say I was just dysfunctional and I, and I didn't connect, but I was looking at pretty girls. I couldn't wait to have a cigarette. I couldn't wait to get drunk. And I'm talking about 13, 14. So the manifestation of the trauma started to present itself and it didn't want to concentrate in school. It didn't want to be at school. I was at it at school. Um, I had a sandwich round at school as a kid, uh, taking money at school. And then I started thieving when I was about 14 for the pretty girls in the village. And then before I knew it, I, I, I activated myself into... Uh, early drug addiction, around about 17, I started puffing and sniffing cocaine. And then I got the flavour for money. So I, I, I got arrested the first... I got arrested a few times when I was a teenager for silly things. And then I got arrested for handing stolen property, a huge amount of stolen property, when I was about 20. And that was the first time I went into prison. What was prison like for the first time for you? Well, it was funny because... I'm not saying my dad was the elite gangster of London, because he weren't, but everyone knew him and he had a reputation. So I had an identity, identity crisis because I used to be Brian's son. And I weren't, I was Michael, you know. So I think all these labels, they, they burden you. So when I went into prison, most people knew my father. So there was always some tea bags coming down or someone had something for you. There was always a bit of help. And you're Brian's son. I think I rebelled against that. But the first time I walked into prison was in Brixton. You could have a drink in Brixton then. You could have food every day and you'd, you'd have a booze. Um, I used to get a, a pint and a half of lager and a Matthews small bottle of rose. <laughs> Imagine everyone real drunk in the nick. And we used to puff all the time. 
But the first time I went in there, there was a delousing system. So they slinged you in a room, you're naked, they put all this white powder over you and they ate you with this water. And it was a bit of a shock. I thought, okay, now what's going on here? And as soon as I got on the wing, <coughs> there was sort of an availability of, of, of a friendship with people who knew my dad and plus I knew kids in there. But it was a bit of a shock. I was only on remand for a little while then, but it, it was a shock. Did you feel as if you had to make a reputation for yourself as you were sick of getting called Brian's kid? Um, maybe, subconsciously maybe. Um, but I was confused about my old man because the pedestal that he sort of trade put him on, I didn't see that in him. I saw, I saw his weakness. I saw, his, I saw myself. Uh, and that's why I know it's a spiritual concept. It's, it, 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 you call it DNA. Uh, you know, I think it's spiritual. So what I was seeing in him and didn't like, I didn't like about myself. Um, <laughs> but he wasn't, um, he was a tough boy. And I suppose there was that thing about, you know, walking in his shadow. Um, and I always called on him for help. I was for, for the ages of about 19 to about 24, I kept getting in fights, terrible fights. People getting hurt, I was getting hurt. And I would always go to my dad for a backup, which weren't really cool, but... Um, you know, you you, you 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 draw your sword, don't you? Yeah. You can't lose. But if your dad or uncles or brothers are get a good reputation, you tend to utilise that to your advantage, even though it's the wrong advantage, because you kind of push the boundaries. Yeah. Do that extra little bit of damage. Do that extra turn. Thinking your dad knows the top lawyers. Thinking that somebody will square it up anyway, so there's never any backlash. But it's still the stresses that your dad would have went through because your dad would have seen the product himself and you, even though you can see your faults in your dad, he would have seen that in you because you've went down that route of addictions, of mm. prisons. How did your dad treat you when you were going into prison? Was he embarrassed? Was he shocked? Or was he just accepted because that was a life that he knew? No, because the, the, the format of play was when we left London, th this part of his family, because my three elder siblings... Um, from his first marriage, his first wife died. She was a lovely lady, Betty. And there was Christine, Brian and Terry. So Terry was the youngest of his three then. He was a very violent kid. And uh, he, used to, he used to walk about with a rat in his pocket and he was the image of my father. And, and little Brian, I don't mean to disrespect him, but that was his name, little Brian. He was Brian, he looked like my father. He walked like my father, he spoke like my father. And he got a 10 for armed robbery. Uh, back in the day, in, you know, in the 80s. And he said to me a little while ago, he said, what do you think the old man said to me when he come to visit me? So I said, what's that, Brian? He went, what are you doing here? And he said, Dad, what are you talking about? You've been out here all your life. He said, you... So he wasn't happy about him being in prison. He certainly weren't happy about me being in the nick because he tried even harder with me, with my schooling, you know, with the way we lived. We had a nice home. So it was all there, but I don't think the, 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 the sort of your, your environment leads you not to be a criminal. I think it was in me. And, and so when I became him, he didn't like it. No, he didn't. He didn't like it at all. Who went to Spain first, your dad in the 70s? Yeah, my dad was... My, I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy. There's a guy called named Joe Pyle. Yeah. So my, that was my dad's partner. So Joe and my dad were partners for many, many years. Um, and and uh, if, if, if they were still alive, I wouldn't be telling you these stories. But, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my father and Joe were, were, were involved with the Americans. There was a guy called um, Alex Steen, who was, uh, he was, uh, he was involved with the tickets in the West End. And he knew a guy called Wazzle, who was friends with Joe Bagano, the five families in America. And um, my dad and Joe were very friendly with the English people. And my dad and Joe went out to America I think they was on their toes. I think they was wanted by the police or something like that. And they got involved and they met all the five families um, and, and they, there was a, a mutual respect there. And I'm not saying that they done this, but from an introduction, I'm not saying it was the families of the mafia, I'm not shopping anybody, but what came out of it in the early 80s, and it weren't really known in London then, to be honest with you, James, a smuggling route started with cannabis out of Italy, Holland, Spain, and Morocco, and that was my dad and Joe in the 80s. And um, then they, they alleged there was an altercation and, and someone got shot. I don't know who it was, so don't ask me any questions about that. It was, an alle it was alleged, it was an allegation. And I think that sort of, you know, sort of made things a little bit sour. Um, but I was on the peripherals, you know, messing about, and there was 
copious amounts of money around. So you get allured to it. I mean, the allure, I got allured. I loved it. And then um, I got myself in a bit of trouble myself. And then my father and Joe, the end of their sort of reign came in the late 80s when they was arrested for a ton of puff. And um, something happened and they walked free. But they was told there and then by the drug squad, whoever it was, drop it out. You know, you've reigned for a long time. You know, you need to, you, we're going to nick you. So um, that's what I was told because they got out of a, a situation which was a bit saucy. They say that there was something to do with uh, whatever it was. It don't matter what it was. And and I think that was the end of their reign. And then I went to work with my father. How was your dad smuggling the, the graft in? He, he would, I mean, I think the old, they come from lorries uh, from from Europe. Um, and, you know, I think they all got their transport, how they do it. Um, it was coming from Belgium and Holland, I believe. And um, out of Spain. What are you talking then, back in the 70s, 80s, for a Kia Puff? 1,000 oh, quid, 800 yeah, quid? Yeah, I think it was about, yeah, yeah. I think it was about seven or 800 quid, I think, yeah. then. And, um, and then it changed. It, it became sort of, it was like gold, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Was so it then, hash? It was hash. They used to get up. There was a, the first one they got was quite funny. It was a Morocco. It was sorry. It was a uh, Lebanese. Uh, I, it was, it's hilarious. It, it was obviously sort of uh, done specially for this job because it was quite a regular thing. It, it was labelled. I won't tell you what the name of it was because of its mo. But it was all in white Hessian sacks, and it used to come regular. So uh, and there used to be three or four hundred kilo at a time. Uh, and so that went on for for a number of years. Did you smoke then? Were yeah. you smoking hash back then? Or were yeah. you on the weed? I've been at it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've been at it for since I was about seventeen. Puffing, I used to love to puff. What was that? A clap? Because it was a slap in the wrist abroad back in the day. Was it not in the seventies and eighties? Because um, you not buy your way out if you get caught with a shitload of hash. No, I think back in the day, if you was nicked, you was nicked. But I think it was a, a new thing. For, yeah, they're um, more lenient the, the sentences back then. Well, I think so because I think what it is. This is how I view it. I mean, if criminals get involved with robbing banks, then or bank robberies or pavement work, I think then the police or the government say, right, get on them, and they make an example of them. But I think early days in the uh, in London, sort of hashish was wasn't really thing that I think they was sort of on straight away. But once it built its momentum and once it became a financial gain to criminals, then I think that they sort of tightened down on it and the maximum sentence, I think, was 14 years. Mm -hmm. Was that starting to be a turn-on for you then, seeing all the money, the power, the attention? Yeah, I think what it was, James, is... uh, You know, I'm not a kiss and tell, but I've got loads of stories. Obviously, we all have where we come from. But for me... Yeah, the the brokenness of the uh, and it's hard for many people to admit this, but I will because it's my story. But I think the brokenness of Michael, that trauma, that sort of wayward father, that lie that was in my head. You know, he's, even as a young man, they used to have the the uh, sex shops in the West End, and I was only seventeen, and I used to go and pick up the money for them. And I was, so it was, I was allured by it, you know, the West End drugs, uh, sorry, uh, uh, porn shops, you know, pornographic shops. So I was in it. There was, they was doing a long firm, which was, they was defrauding money. So I, I used to see it all, you know. And I think my dad said to me, I think he knew in the back of his mind that I was going to be at it like him. So when, I, when they went in the, in the cannabis and I used to see money being counted and not that he would do it to show me, but I was sort of... I suppose I became trusted and, you know, and I kept my mouth shut. So, yeah, I fancied it strongly. What's the most you've ever counted out? Oh, James. I was nicked for uh, uh, about £10 million worth of cannabis when I got nicked later on. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of money. I can't remember what it was, James. But, but Yeah, it takes hours and hours if you're counting out over, even lot, over a couple a of hundred bags. It's, um, but I'd imagine with your calibre, it's... We counted millions. a lot. Yeah, but I'd we, imagine you had a money machine as well. Yeah, there was things like that in there eventually that we we turned to. But my dad and Joe, it was a little bit like, um, not to decry them at all, but, you know, I don't think, they, no one understood the drug game. 
you know, I think they was very fortunate that they found a way which was which was cool to work under. So their transport was obviously good, but I'm not about to say what's right or wrong here. I don't know who it was and who was involved. But, um, you know, they so the amount of money that was involved then and, and whatever. But as we progressed and we got into our own organisation, then, yeah, I mean, counting money was a specialised thing that I never used to do after that. It used to be given and cleaned. And so you were becoming active and your dad was OK with you being involved in a... The family trade kind of thing in the underworld. Well, I think what the old man done when he got out of his trouble with Joe, and I do believe they was falsely tried. There was four of them, and they was falsely tried. I don't think it was what the, the, the police said in the customs, so I think they quite rightly got acquitted of that. But I think with the, um, with the pressure of thinking they've slipped the noose, even if they was guilty or not guilty, which I believe they was not guilty. There was activity for a number of years. They must have been very clever what they was doing to get away with it for so long. But I found a thing the other day that him and Joe, Joe and my father, was on the te top 10 list for, you know, to nick them for a number of years over the drugs. So they must have been doing it very well. Uh, and when they slipped the noose this time, and, and then I got involved, um, he, I think my dad sort of was happy as well because he was getting old. I think he could trust me. I was around some really good people in London uh, and the operations that they sort of opened up, the doors opened up the door. You had to be responsible, you had to be reliable uh, and you had to love what you was doing. And, and I fitted those, uh, those, uh, those three things. I, I, I enjoyed it. Terribly. What age was your dad at that time? When the old man started to slow down... Uh, he was, uh, I was 34, 35. The old man was probably in his, uh, he was about 60, 62, my age now. It's crazy though that there's no amount of money ever makes you quit. That's the, in that life, that like, it's always disaster and destruction. There's Absolutely. no, there's no get out. There's no 10 million quid, 20 million quid. Then I'll, I'll buy my house and I can do what I want. It's just pure greed. Absolutely. And it? it's just nothing ever never changes. Know where to stop. It's always the same stories, though, isn't it? Absolutely. When did you go to Spain then? In your thirties? <laughs> no, I went to Spain. In your twenties? Well, I was nicked. Funny enough, I see the the guy's son the other day. There's a, he's, I won't. He, his name was Wayne. This guy, and um, he was my uh, he was my pal. Uh, I feel a bit emotional. Sorry. And um, we were young tearaways together, and. Um, we was doing some business just round the corner here, and um, we we got it wasn't massive business, but we was messing about with a bit of cocaine, and uh, the police came on us, and we was in this massive this crazy car chase. God, he could drive this kid, and he was a sweet man, you know, he was a big man, he was a strong man, he fitted the bill as a as a criminal, but I always used to see his heart. He had a really gentle heart, this kid, lovely boy he was. He passed away about seven years ago, tragically. And um, he was misunderstood, this kid. I loved him a lot, this guy. And we fell out in the end, but I loved him. I met his son after 20 years and his grandson. I'm about to meet his grandson on Friday, which I'm very happy about. But back to your question, Spain. Um, so we had this mad car chase where we were chased by three or four police cars, helicopters. There's, there's all sort of stuff in the car. It was locked in the steering wheel. And there was another ounce of coke, which, which I managed to get out the car window. It wasn't. I'm not saying it weren't mine because I'm a goody goody. It just happened to didn't happen to be mine. I just happened to be in the car. And um, although I'd helped him do a few things, but um, we smashed into this concrete pillar doing about 50 mile an hour. He went through the window screen. I busted me knee and me ankle. The car went up in the air, and I think where he hit the wheel, uh, the uh, dry at the steering wheel. I think the drugs was in there. So it constantined, so they didn't find it straight away. And the only thing they found was an ounce, which had been slung out the car, which they never saw. But they saw him see it land. So we're, I'm in a wheelchair. He, he strapped up like that. We go to, uh, we get Nick, go to Brixton. I don't think they'd found all the sort of stuff. I don't think so anyway. I get a bit of bow at judging Chambers. Um, he was badly wanted, this kid. And, and I suppose it was justified that I got I got out of it, really. Listen, I'm not saying I'm a, I had nothing to do with me. I'm not saying that I'm holier than now. But on that particular time, I got the right result and I slipped. 
So I was on a wheelchair, come out the nick, and um, what everyone done in the eighties, they used to go down to Valpea because it was like you had the famous five down there, uh, Ronnie Knight, Freddie Foreman, and all them people. So I went down there. I was wanted by the police. I went down there in 1983. So that's when I was in Marbella. It was totally different then. It was fantastic. Yeah. And I sort of, I'd done a few naughty things there to keep myself going. But something really tragic happened to me when I was there in 83, 84. So I was wanted down there for a year. I was being naughty to, you know, as you do when you're wanted by the police, you've got to keep going. I used to, I messed about up into France and, and, and to Germany and I won't say what I'd done but I was getting a few quid. And then my brother came down, who was the angel of the family. Incredible young kid this was. Martin, his name was. And uh, my grandfather was, he had days to go, he had cancer. So my mother sent my brother down to be with me while my grandfather died, because I was wanted in Spain. We used a bit of cocaine. He wasn't a, he wasn't a drug user, really, he liked to puff. We had an argument about my dad, because my dad was seeing another woman. And he was heartbroken about that, so was I. And at two o'clock in the morning, he had this mad urge to leave. So he walked out of my apartment up on the Aloha Gulf, in my, just behind the Marbella uh, Port of an Horse ball ring. I went and got him, gave him the car, said, come home. He drove off in the car, got to Malaga Airport, sadly, on his way back, went underneath a lorry and he got killed, stone dead, bless his heart. So that was like, whoa. I woke up in the morning and on the mirror, a beautiful thing, he said, I love you, my, I love you in Vaseline. I've still got the mirror today. Well, I can't find it at the moment, but I've had it 30 odd years. And I looked at this mirror and I thought, wow, what, what's going on here? And I went to look for him. I searched the, the, the airport, all my friends. No one knew he'd died. Uh, he never met his son. His girlfriend was six months pregnant. So that was tragic. But that was my life in Spain in the 80s. How does that play a massive part in your mind then? Did that make you question your life or did it just make you fuel you with anger to sell more drugs, make more money, take more drugs? Or did you ever think at that time, I'm going to change for the better? Two great questions. The latter, I went mad. But there was something inside me. You know that little voice that sometimes marks your card, don't do it. But it's so soft, that little voice. The, 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 the voice in the head is... It, I'm gonna do it. So I went from destruction to destruction to destruction, not being av av able to sort of, you know, I had this guilt that I'd killed him. Um, it's just this the way it goes, you know what I mean? So I turned to cocaine. I used to I used to scream at God, "What have you done to me? Why have you taken him? She should have took me." He was a beautiful son. A be it's just a, I'm not just saying it because he was my brother, but he was one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. But I turned to drugs. I'd go up to the uh, cemetery, pour champagne over his thing and put ecstasy tablets down there as if he could use them. It was insane. <laughs> we done that as well. Like my one yeah. of the family members died like four years ago and we were taking lines off the coffin yeah, as you do. <laughs> and you're thinking you're doing a good thing yes. but I know people that's died with overdose mm. and at the parties at the funerals and shit people are bang on it absolutely they're bang on it and yeah. then they use it that as an excuse it's their birthday or it's Christmas or mm. it's a certain day people look for any excuse to take drugs mm. I believe and it's sad that we should do the opposite mm. we should learn to heal we should learn to work on ourselves to become better not do the thing of destruction. We don't know how to handle death and I always say it, that should be getting taught at school. Absolutely. Like grief, that yeah. we mourn death, but really in reality we should celebrate it because mm. life is precious and it Absolutely. can be difficult. So when you went from destruction to destruction to destruction, did your dad see, dad see this or were you kind of hiding away because you were in Spain? <laughs> no, I came home when he... In fact, a, a good friend of yours, I believe, is a guy called Paul Ferris. Yeah, no, Paul will. So Paul was... Paul's... I call him Paul's surrogate father. Yeah. He was a man called Arthur Sutty. He was a, he was a um, Dean Martin look-alike. He used to smoke a cigar. He was very handsome. And Paul knows him well. So I got bought up by the Suttys as well as my father. So Arthur came out to um, Spain to get me, to bring me home. Uh, and bring the coffin home. They brought Martin home. And, and Arthur brought me home. But Arthur was wanted as well. 
So we came back into the UK. We thought we was public enemy number one. We weren't. We weren't. It, we wasn't what they was looking for. And we got through. We came through. We we come home on the boat, and we walked through. And as I landed in the UK, three days after my brother died, then my grandfather died. So my mother buried her father and her son on the same day. So that had an effect on me with my past traumas. And these aren't excuses. They're just my realities. I wish I'd have had the, the nous or the knowledge to think, you've got to change this. Martin would want you to honour his life. But there was a soft voice saying it, but, but the nutty voice went, no, I'm going to destruct, I'm going to destruct. And so my choice of drugs was cocaine and I suppose... I don't want to term my affairs as illegal women because they were lovely girls as well. I've got to be truthful with you. But they were wrong. I had two affairs, which was really wrong. Well, I had a number of affairs, but these two were... So that's what I'd done. I, I had an affair with my wife's then best friend. She's a lovely girl. She was my friend, very attractive, very kind. I thought she was the fix. Um, it, it never worked. It, it made it more destructive. I was lost. I was completely lost. I really think I had a breakdown and all. Um, but I never went that macho thing, you don't have to go to the hospital, you ain't got to do this. I, I sort of done it myself. I went back to my wife, she was putting me on the Valium for about three months. And I was trying to medicate myself to come off this fear, this drama, I thought I was losing my brains. I'd slept with my mate's wife, uh, well his girlfriend, my, she was my wife's best friend. Mine had gone. And the popularity that I think I used to enjoy, I was quite a well-liked kid. I was a money getter. Um, I suppose I could have a bit of a fight. But I wasn't, I didn't like hurting people. But, you know, we went through a stage where that did happen. Crazy arguments and fights and stabbing and all that sort of stuff. And I found myself marooned on an island that I put myself on. And it was an island of destruction. Uh, I, I lost all sense of thing of how to love. I couldn't hear anything nice anyone would say to me. My mother was traumatised. My dad went off and ran off with his woman, this other lady who we had a child with. So the destruction in the family, this once beautiful family, was now completely de destroyed. My dad left my mother, my brother had died, and I was wanted by the police. And it was madness, complete yeah. madness. Same as your dad losing the son, getting the money, having an affairs. You don't know how to deal with the trauma, the pain, but you've also got to keep, take into consideration the trauma and pain that you've caused by certain drugs also. The Absolutely. destruction that's, that's happened to families and how everything is connected, how everything makes you open your eyes. But you are 21 years clean now. Yeah. What's the story with the Page Free Girl who helped you get your shit together? Samantha Fox. Yeah. Yeah. So, I... I <laughs> it's a long old story, but I, I, I abbreviate it for you, James. So... I'd left Tracy after the affair with her friend. We had three children together. Um, beautiful children in my life at home, my kids. So I'd had the breakdown. My dad came out of the nick. I would came out of the nick. And um, it was all sort of money problems, all that going on. So he said to me, listen, he said, I've got an idea. He said, you want to go back out to Spain? So I said, yeah, but I was sort of... I wasn't 100%, but I weren't like I was. I got clean then, and I went out to Spain, and... Uh, was that to do more graft? Yeah, do more graft. This Was in was that not, after your 12? No, this is prior to that. So before that? Yeah, this is prior. So when I got nicked in the 80s, I went to prison. I came out, my had died. I took copious amounts of drugs. I had an affair with my wife's best friend. I had a sort of a breakdown. My dad came to see me and said, listen, you've got to get back on your feet, blah, blah, blah. So... When I said a breakdown, I just hated myself. I hated myself. And nothing could change that. What I'd done to my wife's friend, what I'd done to my wife, what I'd done to other people. So there was always a nice art, but the, the, the nutty brain was, it was powerful, it was addicted, it was, it, and it, it knew no wrong because of the abuse. And that ain't an excuse, because I take responsibility for my own actions. I don't do it today, put it like that. But so I went out to Spain and I met a lovely girl called Daniela, who, whose father had restaurants down on the, up the coast of Fuengarola, sorry, Mijas, Marbella, all along there. And I don't know what happened, but it was like as if she was sent to me. Uh, from the destruction and the heartache I'd caused everyone, this, this lovely young lady appeared. She was from Naples, Italian. 
and, and, and we had a connection and, and, and we had a connection and she was wonderful and she was like my she was like a nurse she, 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 she really took care of me and I, and I got back on my feet and wallop I went to work I went to graft properly and, and so her friend was Samantha Fox so when I got arrested um, in Devon for, for this last situation that I was involved with Samantha Fox she was part of a church in Knightsbridge called Holy Trinity Brompton and um, she'd become a Christian and uh, she was on fire for, for recovery, for getting well and she had her own damage, whatever that is, only Sam knows. She's a lovely girl. And my wife, the Italian, we weren't married then but we got married, she went to see her and she went, look, I, I, she was just wanted me out of prison. She was thinking of everything as you do. What can I do to help him? So she went to see Sam and Sam was part of his church. And so... She come down from Amber Fox. She'd done some great work for me in the prison. She'd done a lot of charity work. We raised money. We had some fun. She I had her in the nick in the, in the chapel. All the chaps were there looking. She was some Amber Fox. She, she was a, she must have been in after prison cells on the wall. <laughs> so so that was how she got in. That's how I, that's it. And she introduced me to this stuff that I do in the prisons. Which it? we'll touch on. So before you got your twelve. You, get, you and your dad get caught at 15 million quid's worth? What, what, what we done, on the, um, in, the, in the February, in the no, sorry, let me get this right. Yeah, in the February, we was, uh, we was alleged, uh, we was charged for an importation that got aborted in, aborted in the Bristol Channel. Um, and uh, it was a massive operation, but we wasn't totally involved with it. We was just trying to do someone a favour. Well, I say our favour, we, we was involved, but it wasn't, our, it, it wasn't our shout, this one. We had nothing to do with it other than trying to get it into the country, so they say. And it got aborted in the Bristol Channel. Um, and so they let it go, and they put a huge observation on us. Um, I was seen on a boat, which was ridiculous. I went on a boat when the thing got aborted. I was seen on this boat. They didn't know it was me. I was all sort of camouflaged. I shouldn't have even been there. You were on the boat with the gear? No, no, no. I, I, I got on the boat when it, it, they towed it into uh, Swansea Harbour. And I was with a, a funny guy from... He was a European guy who was a lunatic killer, this guy. We used to call him Boris the Bastard. And he used to have this big crucifix around his neck. He was, he was an odd character. We have to go, Michael. We have to find out what's happened. Foolishly, we go onto the boat, which is being under observation by customs and excise. I thought I was doing the right thing. I, I ballied up, had a scarf on me. I parked the car three or four miles away. But listen, they, they can follow you three or four miles. But it was that anxiety addict. Where's our money? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Let's investigate it. Everyone kept away. I went on the boat. The police let it go because they couldn't find anything. And they put this operation on us for about, you know, it was about 18 months. And then they nicked us all down in Biddeford. It come in on a boat, on a fishing boat. Uh, we got arrested for four and a half time. Yeah, that's a big bit of intelligence, though, 18 months. Yeah. To put on somebody. Yeah. And that was enough to get your conviction, or get your 10 plus. Yeah, we got 12 and a half years. We, we was quoted to having a fine of uh, three million quid. Or do, I think it was due six years. Um, we, 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 the fine got massively reduced. There was an informant involved with the case. We looked like getting out of it on a point of law, but that never happened. Listen, we done the crime, you do the time. Um, and so we all got 12 and a half years. There was nine of us arrested. There was a fishing boat, fisherman, um, uh, a fishmonger, and the four principals, Dennis Lemonnier. I wouldn't be telling you this if it wasn't documented, but it is. Dennis Lemonnier was the French connection. Me, me old man, and a guy called Peter. Where was Peter from? Peter was from Surrey. <laughs> but he was all right, Peter. The French connection and Peter. Yeah, There's yeah. always a local boy <laughs> somewhere, isn't there? But he lived down there. Yeah. He lived down in Biddeford. So there was a snitch involved in the camp as well, though? Yeah, there was, they, they, there was an informant because the amount of cannabis that was attached to this... Was that your biggest one? God, James, you're pushing the boat out a bit, but yeah, yeah it was, yeah, it was. Mm. No, it's your call, your call. Yeah. But it was attached to a huge consignment, this was. Um, <laughs> excuse me, it come, from, it come from a lot farther than Morocco. And I think what they do, they, they break the cannabis down and it goes around the world to different venues. I don't know what the, the exact amount was, well, I do, but I can't say that. It, it was huge. And I think we was 
participating in probably about four or five different entries into different parts of Europe and around the world. So we was one of, of, of many other enterprises. But I suppose with my dad sort of, they wanted my dad, but I don't think my dad bought it on this. I think the surveillance and the informant come from abroad. How, when you've got that addiction problem, sex addiction, drug addiction, power, money, when that's all coming in, how many people did you have around you at that time? Well, the, the, on a work level... Yeah, when you, were, when you were flying high, when you think you were flying high, but that's when you had your most problems and trauma, when you had all the, yeah. the, the external shit. Absolutely. But did you have floods of people want to be your best friend, this is my brother, this is... And then what I'm trying to touch on is, when you, you thought you were flying high, when you had everything, the, how many people did you have around you? But when the shit hit the fan and you get your 12, how many of those people were still around you? Well, at that particular time, there was a lot of people around who, 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 who you think you're getting a few quid. But the people I was with, they were good standing comrades. We'd, be, we'd been around for a number of years together. Um, and because of the intensity of the crime, and, and you've got to be with people you trust, because if, if they're in police stations, you've got to keep your mouth shut. So at that particular time, we was a good, solid team, yeah? And when we got nicked and we got sentenced, then the, the people who remained, I knew would remain. But the, a scenario happened to me like that further on in my life, when I had everything and had a thousand people around me and when I lost everything, people were still good to me, but a lot of people sort of just... Step back. Yeah. What age was your dad when he got to 12? The old man, when he got to 12, he was hilarious, my father. He said to the judge, you've sentenced me to death. Um, they wanted him, the old man. Uh, my dad, so it was in 1993. He was, <coughs> excuse me, he was born in 31. So what, what I think he was about 62. Uh, 93, so done in 93, born in 31. Yeah, so he was 62. 62. He was 62. He came out of prison when he was nearly 70, bless So you both were dubbed up together, you were in the same cell? Two years. Did they ever say to you, did they ever say to you, I've let you down, or, did they ever, or was it just part and parcel of the game, kind of just laugh it off mentality? Like for my son, like that would be the last thing on my mind is to get him involved. If I was active still, and I was to get him involved... Because of the knowledge that I know now and how fucked up that life is, that like, if I was active, then probably it's the difficult one because then you think, get him in the family trade, make him a crust. But when you break it all down, when you fuck knows how I've seen the world differently, I don't know. Mm. But when you see the trauma, when you see the pain, you get an understanding, wow, man, not only am I destroying my own lives, but I'm destroying everybody else's. So your dad must have felt a part that your dad's in his 60s, he's in the same cell as his son. There must come a moment where you think, I've done wrong here. I've fucked up. Yeah. I think for my dad, where he, he had that opposite, he was fearful but fearless. So he was spoiled and all. So he didn't fancy being in prison. Um, he always kept his mouth shut, my dad. But there was always an angle for my father. He was always looking for an angle. To say he was a war child. And um, so it was me who gallantly said you're 62, I'll take this on the chin. Because it was, although it was his introduction, this was my shout. It was me who created this, it wasn't him, yeah? But it was through his introductions. So I had a responsibility. But even at that, if I'd have been my dad, I think I'd have said, son, you've got three children growing up, I'll, I'll take this on the chin. And I think he did at one stage think like that. But as the rot of the prison sets in and the cobwebs and the cold and the, the reality set in, he, he sort of spun it that he was the older one and, you know, I'd be home in five, six years. And, and plus it was hard for him to get out of it and me. It was very hard for one of us to take the fall. But it was disgust. Uh, and it was resentments, there was angers. We set about each other in the cell. We got high in the cell together. He never used to smoke cannabis until he was in the nick. So I'd get high with him, sing with him. So, but I saw a side of him that I didn't like, and he obviously see things in me I didn't, I didn't like. But at the end of the day, we were stuck at the hip, no matter what. Why did the W's up together? Do you think your cell was bugged as well? 
maybe early days, early days, but he was, um, it was hard work. Two years I'd done it with him. <laughs> he aggravated the life out of me. So there was a, was a, a possible deal on there for either him to take the blame one gets away or you take the blame, but both of you just end up doing yeah. it together? Well, I think there was there, but when we looked at it, it was just... You're exactly like your dad, by the way. Do you yeah, like, fucking like that. exactly for me looking from the outside and this is what I do so yeah. for me looking at the outside in your mind it's your turn your yeah. dad's been caught yeah. you're thinking right maybe I should take the blame but still part in your mind is thinking I've got three kids absolutely. your dad should take the blame so yeah. both of you were looking for angles out absolutely and, and, and the funny thing is any one of you would have been happy for any one of you to Abs- take the fall absolutely <laughs> absolutely but it had to be worked out but, was- but both of you are too stubborn to uh, um, uh, we were but in the end stubbornness prevailed and then yeah it, you know what we, we went to the mercy of the courts in the end there was maybe a chance to run with it but look do you know what I'm so happy that I went to prison. I'm sorry. Why? Well, because it was the start of the change in my life. Um, I was very blessed in the Nick um, that I found something that was a lot more, I'm not religious, <laughs> but I have a faith, yeah? And my faith is in God, it is in the church. But I, I like the, the side of it that is the thing called the Holy Spirit. They all talk about spirituality. And we, the air to breathe, the, the, the beauty of nature. So I believe that there's something out there that not only can sh- tell me is a set of rules to change, but I think it comes to live in us because I've experienced that. And I'm not holier than now and, and I get it wrong badly. And, but so I, I, I got introduced to something in a chapel via Samantha Fox, via my first wife, Daniela. They came along. Uh, I, they got me involved with the church. I spoke to the guy called Nicky Gumble. He's a great guy, Nicky Gumble, and he run, he's the home of Alpha, which is in Knightsbridge. And they do so much around the world. You know, I mean, they do. They work with the homeless. They work with a drug addict. They work with a criminal. They work with everybody. Debt. They're a great church, and it's worldwide now. Great, great, great team. And I had the privilege of knowing the people who run it, which was lovely. Um, Emmy Wilson was a very dear friend. Um, so we phoned up Nicky Gumber, very, very posh, you know, and I got on the phone to him. But he'd heard about me because Daniela and Samantha Fox, they'd prayed for me. And you know what? I felt a bit different when they was praying for me, but I thought it was a, a, a delusional because they was 300 mile away. But God's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So we then phoned up Nicky Gumbel. I, w- I was looking at the mail on Sunday in the Nick, and I see the church that Daniela and Samantha Fox was going to in Knightsbridge. So I went down to the chaplain, always looking for an angle. I went down to the chaplain and I said, phone up this... Anyway, he's phoned up. You can't get through to him. A bit like yourself, James. <laughs> and they got him. And I spoke to him. He sent five people down. And this might sound weird, corny, or not real, or it might sound a desperate... I was desperate. Maybe I was desperate, but I, I was a man of many miles. You wouldn't have seen how desperate I was. I, I, was, I used to think on my feet. And there was always a move. But um, I was open to something and they prayed in the chapel. And I definitely, definitely, definitely experienced something that didn't have a, had a value that I didn't understand. It, although I understood what the value was after it happened, but at that particular time, something moved in the atmosphere, something touched me. And, and I thought, my God, it's real. And I don't know what happened. I, I, people manifest in loads of different ways. I just got the simplicity of a touch of love, of peace, and the word that entered my head was hope. And, and, and that was the start of me, my quest to change. It was many years ago and it's been hard for me to change. Yeah. But that was my first, and an Alpha in prison started, which is now, it's a Christianity course in prison, which has gone around the world. Mm-hmm. Because when you were in prison, there was other prisoners laughing, but there was also some crying when you were going through this transition. Yeah, they, uh, what you mean, mocking me? Yeah. Absolutely, they, because they would, it's what they do. How but, hard was that for you then to no. be a drug addict, drug smuggler, breaking out of a relationship that you've ever been in, to then try to find some acceptance, to find, try and get rid of the peace, and the, the, try and get rid of the trauma to find some peace? Like, how hard was that for you to then see the world differently? When, 
when they used to say it, shout out RCs for Chapel in Swaleside. What did they used to shout? RCs for Chapel. RCs. RCs. Uh-huh. Not RCs. <laughs> RC for Chapel. Uh-huh. So um, that's what they used to shout. Now on my wing, there was <laughs> probably two, 200 people, 180 people. Only four went to Chapel. So I used to say to the prison officer, do me a favour, mate. Can you just come round to the cell? And say it's church. I said, You're shouting it over the tannoyd. And all my mates used to shout out, You're going to church, Michael? Uh, and I, I had to go because of the experience that I'd felt in that chapel in, in, in Exeter. And, and this movement of the spirit around the prisons, working with addictions, I had to go. No one ever said it to my face, but I knew that there were sniggers. But it was my recovery, it was, it, and, and because it was life-changing, that particular moment, there's a man in the Bible called David, King David, and he was a rascal. And he was the king, and he, he killed his best friend and slept with his wife. I'm not condoning that. But God said he's a man after my own heart. And when David shouts out to God, he, he simplified it, saying to, to him, whether you believe this or not, I'm, I'm just saying what it says in the Bible, um, that we desire the truth in our innermost being. And I think our innermost being is in that deep part of, 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 of where we're attached to our mother, that, that really deep, dark that place, our soul, which can get really crusty, dirty, painful. And I think that's where I got touched by this thing that was far greater than me. So that's how I understood it. Uh, and when I got touched by that, what it, what it gave me was was something that could help me change and I could be a better person and, and I could be kind and I could like myself because there was a part of me that I did like but I was consumed with addiction, consumed with aggression, anger, pride, greed, lust. So this was my journey of change. So I had to go to church every time they said RC's for chapel. So How I did went. your dad treat you? When you're doing that transition, you're trying to make changes in your life. He came with me because he always had that sort of cap. Not that he, he, he's belief. He always had a belief. I mean, I've always believed. I used to pray to God to get me cannabis home. I'd say, if you do it, get this one home, I'll never do it again. <laughs> Insane. Mm-hmm. So the madness was there. Yeah. I always respected church, but the old man got touched by it as well. <laughs> Excuse me, but he was a he was a very bright man. So he believed, always believed in it, but it sort of ebbed away from my dad. It was like a good feel factor. He liked it. And this, 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 this course became huge. I mean, there was one guy in Uganda who'd done the course. I met him three years ago. He was on death row for 26 years, done alpha in prisons, got reprieved, and now works for the Ugandan minister. Uh, got, sorry, he was a Ugandan minister. It was a political coup. He was on death row for 26 years, saw Alpha in prisons, done it, and they gave him his job back in the government. And I met him three years ago, and I thought to myself, my God, you know, as much as you can work or do business and see it grow, this was a move of the spirit that saved that man from being killed in the nick. I mean, that's incredible. And so that confirms to me that what we started has bore fruit for people to get salvation, yeah. to, to, to change. I'm all for anybody changing, no matter what you focus your energy into, yeah. religion or whatever. Like homeless people, people with addictions, I know people's went down the Christianity route, and if they're focusing on that and it's getting them to stop doing bad things, then so be it. I'm very open to everything. When did you ever, when did you tell your dad about your abuse? Was it a young age, or did you ever tell your Never dad? Never told him. Nah, why? Because uh, it would have, he'd have got really angry. Uh, and I didn't want to hurt my mother. Um, but um, did I tell my mum towards the end of her life? I think I might have told my mum. But I couldn't tell him. He would have been... I don't know, I just chose not to. And do you know what? It was really weird. Because I was in denial about it. I, 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 I started to believe it never happened. And then I went into some therapy about 20 years ago, just up the road here. And when he started to un- unpack it and tell me what effect that has on a child of my age, that things that the girl done to me, I repeated as I got older, not to other people, to myself. 
So it did have an effect on me. It, 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 you know, it, it did claim a righteousness, which all right, wasn't righteous. It became part of me, it, not a righteousness, that's the wrong word, but it, it, it claimed part of my system. It functioned in me. And I'm not saying it because I want to, uh, you know, get out of jail card free from the own stuff, my stuff I've done to women, but it claimed stickers to me and it had a profound effect on how I fought, how I had sex. Um, I've never abused women sexually, but I've 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 been emotion I've been, I've been very abusive emotionally, which I don't do today. So I have changed, but you know I, I'm pleased that I found a way out. I really am. It ain't been easy for me. I was like Bambi on ice at first. How did you learn how to forgive? How did I what, James? Learn how to forgive. So is that a hard, that's a very hard part in life yeah. to learn how to forgive people to eventually accept to then move on. It can be difficult. Did you <laughs> learn how to forgive? Are you still going through that process? Um, do you know what? I, I don't know. I don't think I've forgiven myself totally. But because I've done things which I'm not happy about, I found it easy to forgive other people because of my own behaviour. Um, and so that helped me to forgive. Um, my forgiveness today, I've had to forgive a number of people. I've had to have a lot of forgiveness. So I, I'm all right with the forgiveness, but I have to work at it still. I can still get carried away. Someone stole a huge amount of money off me about 14 years ago, and it caused me a lot of aggravation. And if I want, every now and again, I can go, oh, yeah. But what I do is I accept it. I, I look at my part in it. You know, I blamed him. I never stole the money, but I blamed him but my part was, why trust him? Why all these lovely friends and family who were my friends, why did I trust him, this guy with their money? My ignorance, my greed, or whatever it was. So I played a part. Um, so forgiveness for me is, is a lot easier, a lot easier for me, because I've had to learn it, and I've had to teach myself. But I have to do it, not daily, but I have to concentrate on it when it pops up. How did you get through your 12 stretch, Michael? How did I get through my... I was a crazy addict, so I, I, I was in the church, um, and I knew everyone in the nick. So as much as I was in the church, I used to still have the fun. I, I, I mean, I stopped drinking and taking drugs. How and many I, years into your sentence? A year. So very early? Very early, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I still used to have the enjoyment. I mean, I used to, we used to set up charity events in the nick, we had Ray Reard and the snooker player come down to play for us down in Exeter. We had Samantha Fox come in the prison. She presented some awards. It was fantastic. We had all, all that on video. I stole the video. I caused murders. <laughs> I caused murders. But so, yeah, and so that happened. And um, I, I, I used it to... Uh, it weren't easy because there's a... There's a uh, like we say, there's a, there's a mock with it. There's, there's, a, there's a challenge with it. But if you take the power on of what does exist in recovery, you begin to like yourself. You get clean. There's more of an alignment in oneself. So that's how I got through it, through my faith. And plus, I knew everybody. Every nick we was in, I was playing football, I was in the gyms. We, we, we set up a big charity in a, in, a, in a DCAP prison down in Kent where we was working with MenCAP. So we used to go out, we, we used to get money for them, we used to do all sorts of things, do charity events, we used to do boots, uh, boot fairs, we used to do Father Christmases, we used to do food hampers. So, you know, I was always busy. and, mm -hmm. and uh, Take your mind off the pain a bit. How many different jails were you in, Michael? I've done a number of jails in all my... In all I've done... I've done uh, Exeter, uh, Swaleside, Maidstone, Blantyre, Latchmere. I've done five prisons, Brixton, ones. I've done about seven, an East Church. I've been in eight different prisons over my career of being yeah, in the So knee. you've met a lot of naughty bastards. How was that? Did anybody ever... There's not many people change in prison. There's not many people change. Um, did you ever... Did anybody ever say to you, take you under their wing to try and create change as well for you? Yeah. I'll tell you what, one of the funniest things that happened to me in the Nick was um, when I went to Maidstone, Reggie Cray was there and he knew my father. And I wasn't sort of taken back that it was Reggie Cray. I, I'd, I'd seen these people for years. 
But from the... And uh, Winston Silcott, I don't know if you know who Winston Silcott no. is. He was arrested for... Which he got a not guilty on the uh, murder of PC Blakelock. So it was a big crime. So you, you always have images of these people, what you think they're like. Winston was the most loveliest guy. It was proved he was not guilty. But the image of him in my head prior to meeting him, you think, wow, you know, who's this guy? And blah, blah, blah. He's a smashing guy. And Reggie Cray. And I was away with lots of London villains. And they were great fun. We had some great fun. We had some great fun. Great football matches. But there was one situation when I met Reg. And he, got, he adhered to me because of my faith. He wrote about it in his book that I, he believed I was a Christian. So we used to work the cleaning together on the landings, me and Reg. And he loved, like, celebrities. And I introduced him to the Sex Pistols. He was going to do some work with them on their album. There was a guy, the drummer from Pink Floyd. He sent his drums into it, a drumstick into him. You know, he had a big following, Reg. Massive uh, letters every day he used to get. And but we become acquainted. I used to go into his cell and we pray together. And, and one of the biggest things that, uh, about that with Reg, because I had some fun with Reggie Cray, um, uh, and he was a character, and, 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 and he'd done wrong. We know he'd done wrong. Um, and, and, but he served his time. He'd done 33 years in the Nick Reg. Um, and I don't think he was what they say he was. So I got into his mental side of his life and his spiritual side of his life, and I found him very interesting. And I used to help him. And, and, he, and then when Daniela, my wife, she, um, she left me when I was in jail and she met someone. And um, so that was a big test of my faith. How was that for you? Because well, knowing that you'd done wrong in relationships before, to then getting a taste of your own medicine? Yeah. Um, well, that, what tripped in was I was devastated because I loved her. Um, but I had Tracy and the children, which I always don't think I ever really left. So that was, on, that was in the relationship. Um, she was a young girl, very pretty, very kind. She'd been very kind to me, Daniela. She was of Catholic, Italian descent. So she had that very sort of Italian, Catholic way about her. But I think there was an acceptance before it happened. I think subconscious, subconsciously I was pushing her away. But when it happened, I went and got drunk. And um, After being clean? Yeah, I, I went and got drunk on the landing. I went and got drunk. And uh, so that, that, that night I was in my cell. I, I lost the plot. I was just broke. All up. I embarrassed myself shouting out the window. And uh, But the following day, Reg come and got me. And he said, let's go over to church, Michael. And we went to the church and he said, you need to forgive him. So I'd never really understand. So I understood it, but it was verbalised to me. So me and Reg prayed. I prayed for her and the fella. I'm not saying it went away. But because I loved and cared about her, it made it easier for me. Because my love for her was pure. She'd been very kind to me. She'd been very honest with me. So I tried to return that by not being spoiled, self-seeking, uh, spoiled, selfish, angry. Because they was about, they wanted to go, listen, you. I knew the fella. Um, you know what, I, I learned to forgive and I got through it and I was getting through it. But she remained in my heart for years, that girl, because I genuinely loved her. So when my friend came to see me, he said, you know, we can't stand for this. I said, no, no, you, I don't want you to do anything about it. He said, why not? I said, because I genuinely love her. And even when the words came out of my mouth, I thought, wow, you know, I'm changing. So I blessed her. It weren't easy, though, but I blessed her. I blessed her. Is that when you realised you were starting to make changes instead of trying to get revenge and yeah. attack with anger and vengeance and calculations and then when you started putting all your focus onto you and understanding that forgiveness is key to then moving on in life? Yeah, yeah. you're a great interviewer, son. Thank you. Very good. Sorry to call you son. That's okay. Um, so, yeah... Um, I can see it still affects you though like you spoke about a lot of stuff you spoke about losing your brother you spoke about being in a cell with your yeah, father I can yeah. still see pain with you but yeah. this one I can see has triggered you the most I'll tell you why because 
it brought it all to a head for me. But the most painful experience for me was my brother dying. Um, and I, I, I tell you what, I, I, the look on my face then was, uh, I, I felt warmth about her because we're still friends. But it hurt me. Um, but you said something to me a few minutes ago about was it easy to accept because it was the return of the karma? Um, and was I changing? So, yeah, they, they're both in there, both of them, because I've been a right, it's good coin a phrase, I've been a right shit to women. But all my ex-girlfriends, and I'm not like I've had thousands, I don't mean to beat myself <laughs> up. Same brother, do I? <laughs> but we're all, we're all good mates. Yeah. We're all mates. So with Daniela, I held a flame in my heart for years and years for her, and it was painful. Yeah, it was painful, so you detected right there. Um, but the, the, the influx of my children coming back in my life, and, and then I, I went back to the mother of my children um, and married her. But yeah, no, I was upset about Danny. Yeah, absolutely, you picked that up. Yeah, because it makes you reflect, though, that if you would felt that pain, imagine what all the women have felt mm. that you have done to them. Absolutely. Getting that information. So what happens is the ego's been dented. Mm. We don't like it. How the fuck can he do that to me? Mm. Constantly look for revenge. I'll get him back. I'll mm. destroy her life. But then you go, well, wait a minute. Look at this shit that I've done. Mm. Look at the destruction that I've done. Yeah. This is just to tell me that, you know what? I don't like this feeling and I don't want to do it anymore. People mm. can hurt me. They can do what they want, but I'm not going to react because as soon as you give it the energy, then you, you're no different. So it can be different, no matter if it's somebody cheating, no matter if it's whether it's taking drugs, no matter if it's stealing. Karma always plays a part. Keep your vibration pure, keep your energy pure, and good things will happen. But Amen. it doesn't mean that I'm not drinking, I'm not taking drugs, you're not you're clean twenty one years. Doesn't mean your life's great. Bad <laughs> shit happens more. Absolutely. You just handle it better. Like, yeah, that's true. I'm unbreakable, not untouchable. Here mentally, yeah. I've created such something that I believe I've still got so much to work on now we've spoken on the phone and we connected where we just it made sense yeah. that we're both still vulnerable we're Absolutely. both still hurting no matter how much we change no matter if, if you turn to God or Christianity or whatever religion you want to ch we're, we're still set that means that we're searching for something we're searching for some sort of peace mm. when really will we ever find that? well he's good isn't he? <laughs> He's very good. Uh, I didn't expect you to be this good. Not that I think you was bad, <laughs> but he's fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I've tried to tell my story, and I I I I, I want to listen to that question because it's a great question. And um, do we ever find true peace? I think if we if I gauge from sexual addiction. To abuse, sexual addiction, death, wealth, poverty. I've lived in every one of those. Um, and I'm not the same person I was. So I've obtained some sort of peace. I've attained, obtained some sort of mental health. Uh, my mental health was bad. It was really bad. But the rest of me was all right. So there was a constant battle. So my mental health today is far greater than it's ever been. More healed. Sorry, it sounds like I'm saying I'm madder. No, my mental health has got better. So I think better. I, 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 I know how to train my brain. I'm not got it exactly right, but I can train my brain to not think about the things that it wants to think about. Because all it wants to do is start a conversation in my head with my shame, my guilt, my debts, my this, my that. <laughs> but then there's a flood of love in my heart. And I'm not being over spiritual or over silly, but we're all human beings and we all have love in our heart, whether we like that or not. And <laughs> so my love in my heart, I try to get out. So do we ever really get peace completely? I don't know, we can keep trying though. Yeah, I think we'll keep pushing yeah. towards it. Like I'm constantly searching for answers, for tools, for techniques to help yes. improve me. I don't preach... Well, maybe I do preach because I'm feeling good. Now, I quit the drink, the drugs, the gambling, fucking women. Uh, but I was still... I created everything from the outside of my life. Right. Creating a platform, doing what I do, making some money, legit. But then I felt I was becoming unhappy because I wasn't going within. I wasn't 
going deep within myself. Now, you says it there, like, it's not that when you get peace, what happens is when we're going to do something, back in the day, it's all ego, you're a narcissist, so what happens is you don't think about anybody else, but when you start understanding other people's feelings and emotions, then when something presents itself, you think, how will other people think or feel if I do this anyway? So you become more conscious of the decisions that you're making, mm. and that's when you start not doing as many bad things or daft shit where other people are hurting from it. So if I hurt anybody, then it's just purely my actions that have done that. And if I hurt myself, it's purely my actions. I know right from wrong. You know right from wrong. Everybody knows right from wrong. It's just to find that inner strength to go, do you know what? I'm not going to do this for the selfish reasons. I'm going to do it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Even though still, some people can still be hurt by making the right choices in life. Absolutely. But as long as you're doing it purely for your, your heart, and it is, it's so difficult because we live in a fast-paced world though. It's so difficult because we're all constantly competing. Same as social media, same as I want to be the biggest podcast and I want to do this and do that. When you break it all down, that's still part of my ego. But then I'm focusing it on to accomplishing something as well to then show that it can be done. But in reality, when I fucking break it all down, if you take it all away, the question is, am I happy? And that's the question that... I well, let me ask you a question. Yeah, on you go. Oh, I think there's a part of you that's very humble. But you're, you're very self-critical of yourself, and I identify, yeah? But for a man of your years and where you are today, whatever the purpose has been, you can always change the motive. So if you started this for the, for the purpose of ego or pride, I'm not saying you did. Yeah, I did probably, yeah. yeah. But now you've got into that stage where you've become aware and you want to change, and you're changing, and you're changing, and you've got the cojones to speak about it on air. So there's a reality, there's a, there, there's a marker in you somewhere that's gone, I want to change. Now, it don't come easy. It don't come easy. But I think what we need to change is our reactions to, hold on a minute, if you do this, you're going to hurt someone, right? I've hurt a lot of people. I've also helped a lot of people, but I've hurt a lot of people, not because I hated them, because I, I wasn't well. Because you hurt yourself. You yeah, hated absolutely. Yourself. Amen. I hated myself. Yeah. But I think if we change the motive, yeah, or start to agree with the motive, because the brain wants to tell us everything else, but if your motives are good, pure, and good, and you're out, you're out to have loads of money from this, it's fine. It's what you do with it. It's an energy exchange. Absolutely. And it's, if we love money, we're never going to get enough. Mm -hmm. But if we accept money to be a purpose of good, that we can have a nice life and help other people. Now, we can say that and not mean it, but you keep saying it enough, it becomes a reality. Yeah. It's just when you create all this stuff as well. So when I created all this, part of me three years ago thought this would be the fulfillment. This would be fulfill the loneliness, the emptiness. But then when I started getting it, I realised very quickly that this where I ain't going. This is where I'm not going to get my happiness. Now I love what I do. I believe I'm the best at what I do, but it's. Um, I just don't think that this is not where I'm going to get my fulfilment. This is why I'm pushing my extremes now with health, fitness, a bit of meditation to quiet the mind. There's just so many different things. I'm only trying to test the waters to see what makes me feel happy in the morning. Now you don't wake up happy every morning. It's an illusion. You you ain't happy and positive twenty four seven. You can't buy into that bullshit, no. but. There's things that you do in your life that actually do make you happy. Drugs used to make me happy. Women made me happy, but only for a very short fix. Yeah. It wasn't a longevity. It wasn't for hours or weeks or months or years on end. It was just short fix. Drugs, sex, gambling. It just fulfilled the emptiness that I had for minutes, seconds, whatever the fuck it was. Mm. But then you start realising, okay, I want to live a long, happy, yeah. healthy life. So what do I do to do that? Okay, I'll cut out the bad shit that I knew. The three key elements was the drink, yeah. the drugs, and the gambling. Yeah. I done that. But then I started creating a platform. I started creating a podcast. It started getting a lot of attention. People were loving it. And then the novelty started wearing off, and I think, fuck me, man. Like, this ain't lasting long either. Like, I don't know how long this will last. So I'll ride the wave, but as long as I'm <coughs> creating other things around it so that absolutely I can I can also dip into other things and just it's trial and error with life like we don't have all the t t the, the answers you don't have all the answers but you're speaking from experience as well like from dark places from the brinks of fucking hell I've not been to hell once I've been there a good few times and I thought right okay is this it you don't need to accept that life so for anybody watching as well you don't need to accept a life of misery a, 
abusive relationships, addictions, whatever you've got, you can make changes. You're living proof. I'm living proof that you can make changes. A lot of people are coming in at the tail end of my stuff as well and thinking, yeah, it's just an interview or this and that, but they don't realise the depths that I've actually went through in life to then pull myself out, to then shooting into the sky and, and flying high. But it's mm. still difficult. It's not just, okay, he's doing well and that's it. But people, I spoke on the phone and somebody says, oh, you, yeah. everybody says you're doing well, but I always think, I fooled you. But I still feel like a fraud sometimes. Yeah, I understand. And that's hard. Do you know what, though, James? Look, if we was to be able to take trauma out of our system and put it there, mm. yeah, and and so it became it becomes like a seed in us that we that we that we feed, yeah. So we feel trauma with traumatic things, yeah. And I think as we grow, the inner child gets lost. So the inner child was screaming at six. When it's 60 and it's still screaming, it, it, a, a six-year-old can throw a toy, but a 60-year-old could throw an hammer. But it's the same emotion, yeah? So I think for me to go back to the basics, yeah, of all my ups and downs in life, then if I go back to that inner child, it's really been hurt. And it ain't an excuse because that inner child hurt a lot of people. And every time it hurt someone, it increased the trauma. So, so the, so the antidote never came. It just got worse, worse, and the vacuum in me that grew and grew and grew. This hole became so hard to fill. There wasn't enough money. There wasn't enough sex. There wasn't enough drugs. There wasn't enough anger. Self hatred. I loathed myself, and I used to think people thought, "God, he's such a nice fella. Why is he doing this to himself?" It was, it was out of control. So when I listened to you, and and I ain't blowing up your ass. Trust me, I'm not doing that. Um, for a young man of your age to be able to equate what you've just said on this, I hope you put that on this. Yeah, I think nothing gets edited out. No, I love it. Because it's incredible that you have an acceptance that you've done wrong and you're trying to do right. And what the ego or the enemy, let's call it the enemy, it wants to kill us. It's cunning and it's baffling. So self-seeking is the worst thing to have. And I don't see you self-seeking at all. And if you have been, who cares? You've got somewhere. But I think the platform you've got here, right mm. here, and the popularity you've got, use it for the purpose of good. See, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to pull the wool over people's eyes. I don't want to portray the great life when it's still a battle. That like, I'd thought that creating this platform, then people would think I was a good guy. Look what he's done. Then it strokes my ego. Then that's when the self-seeking kicks in. So I had to identify and go, wait a minute, stop bullshitting yourself, James. You're still battling, you still struggle, but you still get up every day to keep pushing forward. So if I can keep putting all those things into practice, what I do, it might not be for everybody, the cold water therapy, the yoga, the meditation, the eating cleaner, and the exercise. If I can do all that, no social media as well, but I need the social media for my work, but part of that's thinking, it's still an illusion. And I always say it, that it's making everybody compete with their own lives. It's making everybody hate themselves because they think other people are living a great life like if people just stop bullshitting wow. and talk about the real stuff like wow. it's okay to struggle man like wow. no matter how big this gets no matter the guests that I get every guest that I interview is the same I'm neither up or down like everything's like the same there's no it's weird like I see if, when I've got a guest on as soon as I say boom we're on I'm plugged in yeah. let's go it's eye contact let's take it through our journey let's see where we can go let's Absolutely. connect there's no questions sitting here there's no, no loads of notes we're just shooting the shit and people can understand that no matter if you're a drug smuggler no matter if you're a porn star politician sports star everybody's got one thing in common they're all fucking battling absolutely absolutely and i think terrific i mean i i think you think i'm not going to say this to pump your ego but i'm impressed with the goods you've got not impressed with who you are, because we're all human, but I'm impressed with the goods that you've got because I identify, yeah? Now, I've got a story of recovery in my life that I aim to put something out there. So I'm new to this journey. I'm not new to recovery and new to... But over the last few years, maybe, I've really come to terms with I've had to accept my past and release it. All the good that come through the trial and the tribulation is in me. It's up to me what I do with it. And if I can help one person, then, then I'm doing good. But with what you're talking about, 
no one's got it right. The amount of people that suffer because no one, we're all living in a subconscious mind. What we can get, what do we look like? How much money we got? What car do we drive? How pretty is the girl? We all go through it, yeah? But not I'm still going through it. Every, so am I. Yeah. But my, it's, dilute, it's diluted in me because the awareness and the acceptance that I got of how bad it was, say it was 10, 10 out of 10, I've got it down to about three. So now in that space, the vacuum of anxiety, fear, I can get it and go, no, hold on, just, just stop for a minute. What's the truth of the matter? What are you really thinking? Yeah, is it real what you're thinking? Or even when I go to talk now, I didn't have this give, I used to just scream and shout and want to be the centre no, of the, the, the party. Man in the room. You know? Because I was broken, I was frightened, I was embarrassed. I, not embarrassed, I was just fro frightened, I was traumatised, and I was full of masks. Any mask you wanted, I, I had one for you. Yeah, so how's it been then, being out of prison? How was your life then, you'd you done your 12, and battling and coming clean, and how was it then? How's it been the last uh, 21 years you're clean? And when did you get out of prison? Well, I got out of prison, I was very fortunate that we, there was an appeal when I got out. And um, so, when I got out of prison, I, I would, all my mates, he's a Christian, but a lot of my friends had got into recovery. So it, it, it sort of wore the same hat, yeah? Life was changing. It, it, it was the turn of the 2000s. It was the millennium. There was, things were different, you know? Fashions had changed, music had changed, and, you know, it was part of the e-scene and the, the music and all that, and then the drugs, and then the crime, then the notorious gangsters. It was all mad. None of it was real. None of it. Yeah, yeah. It was just a video in my head. And I would turn up for it. You know, do I look well? Have I got a pretty girl? Is my car right? Yeah, do you know how many tons I've smuggled? You know, all <laughs> complete yeah, tush. Shit. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what a waste of time. Mm -hmm. They call it stinking thinking. But when I came home, um, disaster struck again because I, was, um, I wasn't right. Um, and I, um, you've got to read my book and you'll get it. Yeah, well. Or I'll give you the audio, you can listen to mm -hmm. it. Um, so, because I think you're identified with the insanity of it all. So, um, when I came out, I wasn't skinned, I had money. Everyone was excited, I got home quite quickly. I got home before my father. And when I came home, I was clean. Uh, I went back home to Tracy and the kids. My friends were around. How did Tracy accept you after everything you'd done? Was she still open to you being a changed man? Or did she still... Because even my ex-girlfriends, the ones who I've been really close to back in the day, they don't see me as a changed man. They still think, they think I'm pretending. Well, <laughs> So they do. It takes time, James. Yeah, but this is fucking 10, <laughs> 15 <laughs> years. Oh, okay. Like, I've, been on my, I've been on my journey for six years, seven years. I've had okay. many obstacles, but they still hold that resentment and fear and anger and hatred. And I feel it, and, and quite rightly so, but part of me that they will tell me you're fucking fake and you're this, and part of you still believes that. But then I have to remind myself how far I've come and what I'm doing, because I do a lot of help others as well. I don't promote it. I don't shout it from the rooftops. I don't want the, the gratification for it because it feels right for my soul. Mm. And I, sometimes I think when you don't try and portray yourself as that character, you know you're doing it, and then that's when you're doing it for the right reasons. But it can be difficult, so if your missus is accepting you again, it's, it must have been hard for her as well. In the book, do you, do you know if you know Jonathan Aiken? No. He was the fallen MP who was going to be the Prime Minister, and he got a bit of bird. Jonathan Aiken, Google him. Smashing guy. Um, he got nicked for perjury, and he got... Um, he got tw he was, they say he was going to be the Prime Minister. Uh, he's a mate of mine. He's a very special man. And he wrote the uh, forward in the book, and he wrote uh, about Tracy, and he called Tracy the Rock of Ages. So Tracy and I have always been had a kindred spirit. Um, as much as I've hurt her uh, emotionally, she played her part, but not to the degree. So it's not it's not a blame game. I take full responsibility. She's my best friend today. So when I came out of prison, <coughs> excuse me, there could have been a. Um, 
Sorry, because I've got this nose and it affects my throat. Um, there could have been... Yeah, you got your nose done? Yeah, I just got it done about three months ago, but it's still sort of affecting how I breathe. Is that with the drugs and stuff? That was the drugs and some fighting, and I just couldn't breathe. And they went in there the other day and took it all apart, but it's still it's still not right. I, I think I've got to go back again, but, but that's okay. So it affects my breathing and, and there's a lot of whatever. So, um, so when I came out of prison with Tracy... Um, you know, there was that maybe that financial stability again, although I've always looked after because she's always looked after me. Um, we always had this sort of sexual crush on each other. That was always there, the sex. Sorry, Trace. <laughs> but, uh, and we had three children together. So I went home, but I relapsed. I, I relapsed on cocaine. And uh, Why? I, um, I don't know, I, I wasn't far enough away from it and I was on the beach with a mate of mine and and um, he said, Tracy went, don't give it to him. And and I took it and before you know it, I had another affair. But this time with my, uh, with my best friend's wife, they was, yeah, it was terrible what I'd done. I mean, I wouldn't say their marriage was really rock solid. Solid. It doesn't matter if it was. No, 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 that's not an excuse. Yeah. But it was. I repeated the behaviour again, and I loved that boy. Yeah, I loved him. I did, and we had a very successful. Well, he's got a very successful business that I had with him. That's not important. It broke his heart. It broke my heart. Uh, the girl suffered over it badly. She was a lovely lady, but we had an affair, and we shouldn't have done. You know, it, it was wrong. And this was 20 years ago. I'd just come out of prison. I was a Christian. I'd relapsed. And I had an affair with my business partner, my best friend, someone I love, who I still love. And I believe he still loves me today. He, he's gone on and done very well for himself. But so I had, a, I had an affair. Crazy what I'd done. Uh, I had all these businesses that I built up. Um, but I was insane in it, and, and, and that was the icing on the cake. But it still didn't stop my sex addiction. I still was, it, it was the wanting and the getting, not the doing for me, that excitement, where that old was still, I didn't take everything seriously. I, should, I, was, I wouldn't accept the mentor. I had money, I had houses, I had cars, all that crap that you hide behind. And, and I wasn't coming out, you wasn't getting me. I'd poke my head up. But the, the, the function of the addict thrived on it, thrived on the car, thrived on the money, the beautiful house in Chelsea. Blah, blah. And behind the scenes, this little gremlin was going, Rah! still hurting people. It don't exist today. So I, I'm proof. Sadly, there's been a lot of people hurt. But I think everyone I've hurt has been blessed as well. And that's not a chuck away remark. So I had another affair and... Um, well, and the, you know, it was difficult. It, it was difficult. Then I had a, a child out of wedlock. And then I, after a number of years, the insanity was still there. I just couldn't get it. I knew what peace was like. I knew what the truth was like. I had a huge... I, I, was, I was financially secure. And, but I wasn't right. And, and I, I thought I was mad. I thought, how do I do this? What do I do? But God's got a great way... In the Bible, it says iron sharpens iron. So whatever I had to learn, be it at 62 years of age or 45 years of age, my lesson came when I lost everything. I lost absolute, I, I couldn't afford an Oyster card. Who was that? I, I believe that the foundations of what I'd built my life on, you know, we had, a, we had Kasabian, the music group. It was called Sarah Cruz. Uh, we owned a radio station we had supermarkets, we had a flower business, and I'm not showing off, and we had property portfolio. But I think um, my behavior, it wasn't getting me well. In fact, it was getting me unwell. Uh, and it collapsed. I had a business in America, in New York, um, uh, and it just all, and when the crash came, it weren't the crash that done it. I believe it was my faith that took it all away because underneath it was the illness. And I, and, and I had to get to the illness and it blocked everything. No, I'm all right, I can travel first class. And then I lost a lot of people's money, a lot of people who had trusted me and loved me for years. 
But in that, I know if they're listening, they're probably upset. A lot of them have had, I'm paying it back. But I think what also upset them, that my truth as a friend with them, my loyalty towards them, I was a good friend. We used to have fun. We earned money. It's not only friends, it was family as well. And when my legs got cut, that is when I really got into my recovery. Is that your rock bottom? Yeah. My, I had nothing. And how long ago was that? That started 13 years ago. And how are you feeling now? How's life like now, Michael? Well, life is so much nicer, James. Um, I've got seven grandchildren, four daughters. Fuck's sake, you better get back in the graft, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're doing it. We're, 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 man. We're doing it. <laughs> We're oh, doing all right. Know, yeah, no, no, yeah. Forgive, for, <laughs> forgive him, Lord. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I've enjoyed meeting yeah. you. Um, How did they take you? Do they know your stories yet? Or are they still young? Well, I, I got asked to write this book, and, and there's there's a potential doing a series on that Netflix. Um, it's early days. I, there's stuff that I want to do, and it's not about my ego. It, it was. It ain't no more. So I wrote this book. Uh, and it was an amends as well. And, and a lot of things were being said that weren't true. Uh, and I took that on the chin. But I think God separated me so the mask had come away. So they might not understand that. They go, well, what's he worrying about God for? We want our money back. And they're, they're right. And a lot of people have had their money back or some of it. But so I pray I clear the debt. But what's life like today is... I, I didn't know how to love my f four children. I did. I thought I did. But because of my shame and my, my behaviour, there was always a glass wall between us, me and my children. And then the disaster happened. And, um, and when I found Michael, my rock bottom, <laughs> my first grandson was born the day I lost the money. On November the 22nd, um, 14 years ago. So it was, it, it, was, it was mad. It was the day he was born. Yeah. And this little boy was given to me. He's named Paddy. He lives out in Spain. And I'm not just saying it because he's my grandson. But he's the most incredible kid I've ever met in my life. So when he was given to me, it was the first gift that I'd been given that I could give back but it was a love transaction. It was love, love. There was no money involved. There was no right, there was, there, was, there was nothing wrong or right about it. It was just pure love. And it touched my heart. Now, all my children I'd spoiled rotten with holidays, private school, whatever I'd done. You know, lovely holidays in the south of France, New York, wherever they used to go. You know, they had great times, Marbella, and I'm not blowing my own trumpet, it's what I used to buy. Buy the love and affection. Yeah, I used to, that was my security. And, and, and I, I'd have lonely nights of the soul, dark nights of the soul, thinking, what is going on? Please let my heart connect with my head. Please help me, help me stop this. And I have stopped it. And then he gave me Paddy, a uh, God I believe is a blessing from God. All children are blessings from God. And now I've got seven of them. And every single one of them, I'm, I'm pleased I never had sons. I'm pleased I had daughters, although they've been hard work. But I love my children. But I, I would hate, it, it broke the curse. It broke the sin of the fathers. No girls. And I've now got five grandsons and, and two granddaughters. And I'm not just saying it. Well, I am saying it. From Paddy, he's a bright, lovely kid. He's very well-mannered. His sister, Goo, and I've got two other grandchildren, uh, Livy and Erin. They're from a different part of my family, and they're also beautiful children. Um, they're my son-in-law's children from his first marriage, but they're part of the family. But my own grandchildren, which are Paddy and then Grace, she's electrifying little Grace. She's, she lives out in Spain. She speaks posh. Lovely little kid. She's feisty. She's got the buzz. And they call me Pappy. Hello, Pappy, she says. And then I've got Nolan. He's, he's a little rascal. And he's <laughs> one and a half, and he lives out in Spain. And they've all got this way about them. They've all got this character. They're all sort of... They're not... 
they're all spoiled because my kids spoil them, but they sort of have a resilience about them. They have a knowledge about them that they've picked up in the atmosphere for somewhere or the sin's been broken. And in, in the UK, I've got my Nancy, who, who, who's adorable. And then there's Teddy and, and Alfie. Teddy's a rascal, Alfie's lovely. And then I've got Freddie. And every, as I'm speaking to you, the reason why I've named them so I can feel that emotion in me, I am so blessed that every single one of those children live in my heart. So when I speak from love today, as soon as I see them, I embrace them in love. There's nothing, I didn't have the money to spoil them, so I had to learn what normal people do. Go to the park and kick a ball about, get on a bus, get on a train, go over the park, buy them, you know, because uh, the, the the, my children's life was very sort of completely different. So it was a, a humility, there was a humbleness about it. And I think that love is God love, it's godly love. It, it was humble, it wasn't self-seeking, it didn't cost anything. It was really natural and, and, and I enjoyed that. So I believe those seven children was the turning point of my life. Why do you think you never wanted any sons? Were you scared that your son could have turned out like yourself in your wild years? Was At the time, I didn't realise, but in hindsight, as they say, over the last few years, I'm sort of grateful that I haven't got sons because if they did do what I'd done, I see it in my daughters. My daughters are pretty, they're firecrackers. <laughs> you know, they're not sort of like do gooders, but they know about the faith, they know the recovery, and they're nice kids. I mean, I've got my three children from Tracy, Amy, Lily, and Beth. They're sensational, they're, they're, they're beautiful. And I've got another daughter who lives over in Loughton called Ruby. I don't see a lot of Ruby, but bless her, she's a lovely kid. But my three children here, they're, they're very, very good children. And I'm, I, I'm proud of them. And they've given me seven grandchildren. Now, I don't need any more love in my life. That's plentiful, mm. and I enjoy it. What do you think looking back at your life, Michael? What do I think looking back? Yeah. I've had a fun life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had a fun life. Uh -huh. I've, um, I've eaten the best restaurants in the world, and I've also eaten the worst. I've lived in multi-million pound houses, and I've been homeless. I've drove a brand new Range Rover for 10 years. The last seven years, well, not so much now, I couldn't afford the Oyster. I could afford the Oyster. I'll tell you a little story about that. It'd take me two seconds. One day I was outside my, I was outside South Kensington Tube Station, yeah? I had no money and I could see my flat where I used to live and where I used to park my car. And I cried out to God. I had no money to get home. I needed £4.80 for the ticket. No one would believe this, but this is the truth, yeah? I gave all my expensive clothes away. I thought they was cursed. I thought I was cursed. Crazy. It was crazy. So I prayed, help me. Help me get home. Now, South Kensington Tube Station is really busy. When I walked down the apples, when I walked down the stairs, there was no one there. It's very, very unusual. And there was a noise on the machine. I needed £5 to get home. I could see my flat where I used to park my car. I prayed for help. I heard a noise on the oyster machine. I went over there. Five pound fell out of it. There was no one there. Five pound. Was, now that's answer to prayer. That is answer to prayer. And that's the truth. You know, I've seen miracle after miracle. Yeah. These eyes have seen, uh, I've witnessed murder uh, in a, years ago in a club. I've slept with my friends, my best friend's wife. I'm not, I'm ashamed of myself. I've done loads of lovely things. I've gone around the world speaking in prisons. Um, I've helped lots of, and whatever I've done, it don't matter. I work in the homeless shelter. I love it, absolutely love giving something back because we only keep what we got by giving it away. Well, I pray the stinking thinking don't exist and if it does, I'll keep away from it. And I want to give good away. But I, I've had an unbelievable life. I've lived, I've lived nine or ten different lives. But today, the, the security of my mindset and, and the heartbeat of my heart and the, the spirit that uprises in me when I see my grandchildren, it's all been worth it. I'm really sorry for the people I've hurt. They've all been blessed. And I would honestly say, 
if they was lined up here now, they'd always say at one time in their life, I brought joy to them, fun, financial blessings, loads of things. But it don't justify it because it cut deep. But I've had a fantastic life. Things have, I've been in New York, I've been in the south of France, I, I, I've been in prisons, all sorts of things. I work in the prisons with the, with the young offenders. But the most satisfying thing that I can honestly say today is that my recovery is becoming apparent. My, my well-being is coming apparent. It's things you can't buy. My love for my children is coming apparent. My business has started to get better again. And the Bible says he restores to you the years the locusts have eaten. So as long as I don't love it, as long as I don't take advantage of it ever again, I feel that I'm coming into the autumn of my life and I want to give away what I've been given in a way that I'm not looking for a pat on the back. I, I like to receive from what I give peace, contentment, joy, love, uh, and enjoy my family. Yeah. For anybody watching, Michael, that's maybe in a life of crime, that's maybe battling with addictions, that's maybe in prison, and that's trying to change their life, what advice would you give for them? Get honest. Um, don't be ashamed of your past. Um, there's a lot of help out there, in recovery, churches. But I think the, the thing that we've got to look at is not how many times we've been in prison, not how much money we've had, not how many drugs we've had, I think we've really got to deal with our inner being, yeah? So pride is a cunning enemy, greed, lust. And if we've got the balls to admit we've got them, yeah? And they say shame the devil, yeah? And if we've got the balls to say we've got them and we share it or we put it out there with someone, I think there's a number of people, especially we didn't have it when I was a kid. No one knew about this stuff. I mean, you're very fortunate to be growing in an environment where spirituality and change is apparent. It's accepted. Absolutely. Amen. Good word. So we never had that. You was weak, vulnerable. Well, I love being vulnerable, but you was weak. You were stupid. What do you mean you can't do that? You've got to be a man. And we hear all those things. But I think in the environment of day, especially in prisons, especially with addiction, there's a chance for us. And I think we've just got to be abstinent from what's bad for us and find out what's good for us. You said it earlier, James. Women, drugs, bless women, I love women. Women, drugs, money, greed, all of that. They're short fixes. And we have to work hard to change. It's like the, it's like the uh, plow on the, the, the plowman on the field. You know, we have to churn the weeds. We have to get rid of the, you know, churn the weeds, get rid of the dross. And it's uncomfortable. But that's when we become a man when we accept that we need to change and we embrace the change. And it takes a little while, but I think honesty is the best policy. Yeah, definitely. What things would you like to finish up on, Michael? Your alpha, what is that? Is there anything you'd like to promote and plug? We've got your book. Where can people buy your book, first of all? Amazon? Amazon's the best place. I mean, it's all at, it's all at bookstores, mm -hmm. but it's uh, called Sins of Fathers. It was um, published by Harper and Collins. And Amazon, it's easy to buy. It's audio, it's written. There's a lot of things going on with that book. There's a lot of talk going on with it. Uh, people have come to us and, and asked us, maybe we want to do a documentary, maybe. And um, yeah, so I mean, what would I like to plug? I mean, I, I work with Alpha in prisons. Okay, what is Alpha? If you can explain that for the people. Alpha is a, a, is a Christian course in, in, in prisons um, where it's, it's non-threatening. It's, it's easy to do. You it's have, in every prison or just a few? It's in most prisons in the UK, Scotland, Ireland, all, all around the place. And I just think it's a place that you can feel loved. I mean, they say the tea and coffee is good and the biscuits. But I, I think there's a... It's, it's that thing it's called because it's Christianity. Or in prisons, there's NA and AA. There's self-help groups. But I get involved with AA and CA and NA and, um, and Alpha's a great thing. Alpha's definitely a great thing. It's a 12-week course. Um, and yeah, that sort of thing. And I, I mean, I'm like you, I'm for the homeless. Um, but what would I like to plug? Nothing really. That There's hope for us. Mm -hmm. um, read my book. I'd like them to read my book. Not because I want to sell loads. Because I think they might get a bead on 
no matter how far you fall, no matter how much you've got or what you haven't got, there's a chance for us all. It's called hope. So I work my programme daily. I work, I do the homeless thing. I work in the prisons. Lockdown's made it a bit different, a bit difficult. But I, I would like to end on the word love because I think love, about loving oneself. So the word love is a verb. It's a doing word. So if we love ourselves without the materialistic side of love, because I don't think that is love, but to embrace ourselves, to be kind to ourselves, to, to speak nice things over ourselves. And I think if we can establish a good well-being, however you want to look for it, guys and girls, and then when we start to love ourselves, then we can love other people in a way that's respectable, kind and decent. Yeah. Michael. Bless you. For coming on today, brother, and telling your story. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Bless you. And God bless you. God bless you, James. Take Thank care. you. Thank Cheers. You. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.